we can all get our Bibles out, uh, we'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, in the Psalms passage this morning, uh, it said that in the midst of suffering, we are to revere Christ as Lord, be gentle and respectful, do good. Now those are characteristics of a mature Christian, whether they're suffering or not. Um, what are some traits of those who are immature? If you remember, a few, uh, I guess a month ago, or a few months ago, we were learning about that in our previous sermon series uh, before we kind of broke for the Christmas season. And yeah, I know it, it seems like it's been a while, but we learned how spiritual immaturity was preoccupied with worldliness and just really self-centered, uh, very stagnant, just stuck in the same spot for a long time. If you remember that visual of the church with just a bunch of babies as a nursery just crying. Yeah, ultimately, this immaturity leads to massive division in the church and uh, loses sight of Christ as the head of the church. But there is always hope in Christ, and we'll be learning uh, how to deal with that in a biblical way and under the headship of Christ. So if you can stand with me, we'll be reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 5 to 15. <clears throat> what, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarding according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace, of God, uh, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because a day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You may be seated. Let's turn our heart to the Lord. Let's uh, the word speak to us and bring us to Christ. But you died to bring us to God. You reveal yourself in your word so we can know God. You open our eyes and our hearts to come to your word so that we can see you and love you and respond to you so that we can belong to your kingdom, serve your kingdom, and bring glory to you. Help us as we listen and see what you want us to do so that we can know you and love you and be useful for you. We thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Lynn mentioned, we uh, it's come back now, not only uh, you know for the new year here, with a new uh, new beginning uh, for 2020, but uh, we also uh, come back from the uh, Christmas season where we took a break and uh, uh, and it's, uh, a stay with Luke for for the whole month of December. Now we come back uh, to First Corinthians in the series Practical Faith. We just happen to be on the second part of uh, Your Work Matters. And, uh, and we want just to kind of plunge right in there and uh, uh, as we uh, move forward we will do some review and then uh, as uh, we anchor our uh, foot uh, in, the, in the text and then get our mind uh, all anchored down uh, we will see uh, a tremendous lesson today as we talk about the principle of evaluation of, uh, of our life, of how God works uh, uh, his, uh, his plan in us. Uh, Paul uh, is uh, dealing with the issue in the church of Corinth and he wants them to understand that their work matters as he speaks to us today as well. Your work matters. 
But then uh, he immediately uh, uh, was confronted with a problem in the church, and that is the church is largely uh, immature, uh, with immature uh, people, immature uh, Christians. Uh, he said that I could not speak to you as to spiritual man, but as to man of flesh, as to infants in Christ. Now there, there is uh, something that, uh, that does not connect, and that is uh, infants and work. Uh, when he's talking about immature people in the church, uh, he, he knows that they cannot work, they, they cannot serve. And yet there's such a tremendous uh, uh, um, uh, life that God gives uh, to, to the church and to the individual Christians uh, through the work and through the service that they need to appropriate for themselves uh, in their life. And so he's moving from that and he's, he's dealing with the... the the, the, the matter of immaturity in the church and point to them that, that they have to be uh, moving out of that immaturity quickly because uh, of what uh, the work requires of them because uh, such an important matter and that is uh, serving the Lord. So uh, Paul point out uh, that the Christian has a problem. They have a sad dichotomy uh, between their spiritual perception and their spiritual reality. Uh, they actually uh, feel very happy. Uh, they think they are mature and they feel that they are strong and gifted and blessed. Uh, but the reality is that they are just a bunch of stinking babies crying for milk in the nursery. They feel proud, they feel invincible. Uh, they boast of wisdom of man and seek eloquence and power and avoid the message of the cross. Uh, and they uh, run into the problem that God is... Uh, uh, determined to make no and set aside and prove as foolish uh, all the wisdom of the world uh, and uh, work only uh, in his way uh, with the cross. Uh, so so uh, uh, Paul is uh, 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 bringing them to understand that, uh, that they need to evaluate themselves in the light of scripture and uh, as uh, they look into that they, he uh, point to them that there is uh, the return of Christ coming and uh, they uh, need to look at themselves in light of eternity and the final exam to speak uh, that uh, they will all uh, have to face. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's a day coming and they need to grow up to face it uh, because uh, that day will require of them uh, to measure uh, all, the, all the, the, uh, the works that God has assigned to them to do. Uh, and, <clears throat> And so for them, uh, it is a, a big confrontation, but it, uh, it's also for us this morning as we look into this, into our own life. Uh, we don't need to worry about the Corinthians, they are gone, and, and now they are waiting that uh, final judgment upon their lives and their service. Uh, but the final uh, evaluation is also upon us, uh, our lives and our works. Uh, and uh, as we look into our generation and, uh, and where we are as a church, uh, we are not uh, doing any better than the, the Corinthians when it comes to this truth and the readiness to face the day, the test, the final exam. Uh, we also need to uh, be responsive uh, or, or, and, and responding to what Paul is saying to us uh, this morning. And so as we look uh, in, into this matter, you see in the outline that uh, uh, because uh, our work matters, uh, we need to live our life and build our life with understanding uh, and we need to understand the principle of service, uh, we need to understand uh, the principle of growth, and uh, we need to pr understand the principle of evaluation. Before the break, we uh, cover the, the, the uh, two points, principle of service, principle of growth, and I'll just uh, do a quick review on them, and then we will uh, spend um, uh, all of our time today on the principle of evaluation, uh, how... Uh, uh, to connect to the way God works uh, uh, in our life and how to evaluate that in the way that's pleasing to Him. <clears throat> so there are the three main principles that we're dealing with, service, growth, and, and evaluation. And let's just uh, take uh, the principle of service. Uh, and Paul, uh, uh, after uh, uh, talking to them and saying that uh, uh, I could not even talk to you as a spiritual man but as man of the flesh, as infants in Christ, uh, and uh, and and the, reason, and the reason he said that because they uh, they still freshly in verse three he said that 
uh, since the jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking uh, like mere men? Uh, for one, uh, for one, one said, I am a Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Uh, were you not mere men? So they were divided uh, in terms of personality in the church. Uh, those who, who want to follow uh, Paul, those who want to follow Apollos, and they uh, were divided uh, in their preferences, uh, uh, even uh, in uh, listening to the word and doing God's work. Uh, so Paul says, uh, Paul confronted them and said, you have to understand this first principle uh, uh, the, that uh, uh, governs our life, and, and the first principle is that uh, uh, we are servants, we uh, are uh, servants of God. So he start out and say, uh, uh, what then is pa Apollos and what uh, is Paul? Servants uh, through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So uh, first, uh, the, uh, the uh, clear statement that we are servants. And uh, Paul uh, want to uh, convey upon them uh, the understanding that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, each one of uh, us, each one of them, and, uh, and Paul and Apollos the same. Uh, just uh, uh, instrument in God's hand. He said, I am everything I am because I'm an instrument in the hand of the Lord for his eternal work uh, uh, and the work uh, uh, in the church. Uh, so, 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 so Paul made that statement so that uh, they also understand that they themselves uh, are uh, servants, uh, 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 the servant of the gospel, the servant of, uh, uh, of the Lord. Uh, so, Paul described themselves, uh, himself as a uh, servant, and uh, he want to make sure that uh, they understand that. He said, let a man regard us, uh, us in this manner as servant of Christ. Uh, when we say we are servant, that, uh, that uh, our value is in our service, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that we render the service uh, that uh, people uh, require, and here in, in, in the case, uh, servant of the Lord, we do what he want us to do. So he want, uh, he want the uh, Corinthians to think of service, to think of their life uh, in, uh, in connection to serving the Lord. And uh, they, uh, for, uh, uh, by and large, have failed to grasp the significance of their life uh, and their work. They don't think in terms of being servants of God and serving one another in the church. Now, they do work, they, they, uh, they, uh, they have activities, but their attitude is, is, is wrong and, and their commitment is wrong and uh, their understanding of the value uh, and the connection and the fellowship is uh, based on their own consumerism uh, orientation. Paul said, uh, thing uh, like uh, we do, um, and that is, uh, we are servants. Uh, I am a servant, Apollos a servant, and uh, we serve the Lord that way. So the understanding that we are servants of Christ and we serve Him and His church is fundamental uh, 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 in uh, the attitude that we have in dealing with, in one, with one another. If we don't think uh, as uh, servants, then we will treat uh, others uh, very differently, uh, and, and uh, we will deal with, with the difficulties in life and the challenges and, and even uh, the disappointment, uh, and like we said today, the injustice, uh, the injustice that we uh, encounter in relationship uh, will be very much different as we deal with it. So, uh, so, so, so Paul said, uh, uh, you first understand that you are a servant of God, but uh, then know that, uh, that God works through his servant. Uh, so, uh, so we are servant, uh, but God works through his servant. So he said, what then is Apollos and what then is Paul? Servant uh, through whom you believe. God is working through his servants to bring people to himself, to bring people to faith. And, uh, and uh, Paul said uh, he is the channel of God's work and the church is also the channel of God's work. work uh, God works through his people. Uh, so Paul, uh, Paul said uh, that uh, we are servants uh, and in, in and of ourselves we don't have any value. Uh, we don't have anything to offer. Uh, we just uh, serve uh, as uh, we must. Uh, but God is working his plan in our lives and work. God is doing his uh, 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 um, carry out his purpose in the life of his people as they serve. So, uh, so we understand that uh, that we are the channel of, of God's work, and God works through His servant. 
And when we look at that uh, in life that way, then we understand that, uh, that our power, our impact, uh, our influence come from God. That, uh, that God flows to uh, this, uh, the life of His servants, uh, of His people, uh, His truth uh, in, uh, in the Word, His uh, transformation uh, in the fellowship of the church, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the life in the church uh, to bring others to, uh, to, to Himself. So, uh, so Paul understand that, and so when, 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 uh, when, he, when he look at the channel that God is working through his life, he, he sees that God gives leaders and, and, and teachers uh, to the church to build up the church. Uh, he uh, he sees that the gospel comes to the people by the preaching and, and, and the power of God working through uh, the, uh, the ministry of the word because it is served by uh, the preachers so that people can be transformed. And he sees that uh, when they receive the word of God, uh, what they hear uh, from the preacher, uh, the word changes them and, and, uh, and makes them more like Christ. So, uh, so the servants uh, are who we are, but the channel uh, for God's power, and he's working through, uh, the, uh, through his servants. And then Paul also pointed out that, uh, that uh, where we work, how we work, uh, the station that uh, is given to us, is by God's servant choice. He says, servant through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So, so uh, it is not the, the, that we choose uh, what to do and we choose where to serve. Uh, it is determined for us by the Lord. It is an assignment given to us uh, by, uh, by, by the Lord. So, uh, so again, when we have the perspective that we are servants, and uh, that uh, we are servant uh, that God worked through, that we are channel for His work, and then uh, also understand that the assignment given to us is by God's sovereign choice. We don't choose where to serve, what to serve, or how to serve, when to serve. Those things are determined for us by, by the Lord. And so when we, uh, when we serve, we need to make sure that we are doing His will. Uh, when, uh, when we uh, uh, man our station, we know that it is assignment to us. So he said, to each one as the Lord gave. And so the Lord uh, determined the opportunity, uh, the station, the function that uh, each one of us will serve. So uh, that means that, uh, that we recognize that, uh, that the, the, the will of God is determinative in our life. Uh, that we serve God's will, we serve His pleasure. Uh, we always ask the question, not that what, what I want to do, what I feel like doing, or, uh, or not feel like doing, but uh, what does God want me to do? And if He continue to use me in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the position and in the location that uh, He determined for me, then that's where I am, that's how I serve, and that's where I invest my life. Uh, I don't have any opinion uh, over that. Uh, I completely uh, cast myself in under his guidance. So, uh, so, so Paul developed that uh, throughout the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the different uh, letters that he sent to the churches. We talk about uh, God's will in, uh, in in giving uh, each one of us uh, spiritual gifts. He talked about relationship uh, uh, of members uh, of, of the church, like in the body, uh, in connection serving one another uh, as according to where God put each one of us and where God gave us gift. So clearly, uh, Paul won uh, the, uh, the Corinthians uh, to be mature in their thinking, knowing that they are under God's command, uh, that, uh, that they are not on their own, uh, that they, they are not uh, just uh, babies doing what, what babies do, uh, just uh, focusing on themselves. Uh, they are in the master hand, and the instrument has values only uh, when uh, it is in the master's hand. Uh, when it's not, and it is nothing. Uh, it is worthless and purposeless and meaningless. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, the life that we have, uh, Paul said, it uh, is uh, 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 in connection uh, to the function that God assigned to us. And we are servant. God works through us. And God uh, assigned us uh, sovereignly uh, where He wants us to serve, and we need to be faithful on that. Uh, so we are God's instrument. Our life uh, has value when we are in His hand. 
and uh, we believe and uh, and uh, and do the work as he assigned us uh, to, uh, to, to do. And so uh, the, he now connect to the next point, uh, the next principle, and that is uh, we serve, but it is God who brings result. So it's a principle uh, of growth. What then is Apollos? Uh, what is Paul's servant to whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one? I planted Apollos water, but God was causing the growth. Uh, so, ne uh, so then neither the one who plants or the one who waters is, is anything, but God who causes the growth. Uh, so, so here uh, is, is uh, um, uh, <coughs> with the same focus, uh, saying that the servants fulfill their duties as God uh, assigned to each one, uh, but uh, God will uh, be the one who grants growth who brings growth and who brings the result. Uh, so uh, Paul again uh, makes sure that we understand that principle. Uh, servants uh, do their uh, duties, the so servants fulfill their duties. Um, I planted uh, Apollos waters. Uh, uh, so uh, um, I think we pointed out the fact that uh, when he used the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the verb I planted, uh, Apollos water, he put it in the tense uh, that is past tense uh, and completed um, uh, with the uh, understanding, uh, with the uh, focus that I get my job done, that uh, whatever assigned to me, uh, I'll get it done. Uh, God give me uh, things to do. I don't sit around, I get it done. Uh, and so uh, because uh, the, his servants uh, get things done, uh, Paul said uh, that is how God is working his result uh, uh, in the life of his people. Uh, he, put, uh, he put the, uh, the work of the Lord as continuous uh, and, and the work uh, uh, assigned to the servant is uh, being finished. Uh, so, uh, so God is continuing to, uh, to bring the result through the work of his people, uh, through the faithfulness uh, of, uh, of the servants. So uh, it's, it's simple, uh, a simple reminder that uh, we are to do our assignment, we are to finish what God assigned us to do uh, because uh, he will use it for his purpose and he will use it even beyond our time and even beyond our knowledge uh, and he will grant his result and blessing to the church uh, in his time, uh, in, 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 in his way uh, and, uh, and uh, for his pleasure. Uh, so uh, we focus, uh, post focus on that second part again saying that God causes uh, the, the growth. It is Him uh, that, uh, that gives growth. So neither uh, the one who plants and the one who waters is anything, but God causes uh, the, the, the growth. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul um, come to the point to, uh, to realize that, that if God is not working, uh, if God is not uh, granting the growth, then, uh, uh, then all the things we do will, will, will come to nothing. But uh, he uh, uh, stand in comfort uh, because he know that uh, that God will give God will bring the result. That uh, that uh, we may feel like a failure. We may feel like uh, we come short, and uh, and uh, and a lot of us as we uh, enter into our service and continue in our ministry, uh, we feel the frustration. A lot of time we we feel the burden, and uh, we. Uh, we uh, we uh, want to uh, want to see our expectation expectation fulfilled. Paul remind us that it is the Lord who gives growth, and it is in His time. But for sure, He will give growth. But for sure, He will accomplish His purpose. He uh, He will not fail. Uh, the uh, the spirit uh, the spiritual result is not up to us, uh, uh, but it will be done through us. Uh, it's not up to us, uh, and not dependent upon us. And that's a good thing. Uh, because God is the master, uh, he will make things grow and he will uh, return uh, the result and make things fruitful. Uh, on the other side, we, uh, we avoid uh, being frustrated uh, and, uh, and uh, disappointed uh, because we uh, uh, concentrate on just doing our work and trust that the Lord will uh, do what he is uh, himself uh, uh, working. Uh, we contribute uh, nothing uh, and we add nothing uh, 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 to the result uh, because that's not uh, uh, the, the, the job assigned to us. Um, uh, it is God's work 
and he would do so. Uh, and, and, and we see that in the book of Acts, uh, uh, and, and, and Luke, uh, the author of, uh, of the book of Acts, remind us uh, constantly that it is the Lord who adds to the church. Uh, the Lord adds the number day by day to those who are being saved. Uh, and he said that uh, those who uh, have been appointed to eternal life, believe me, added to the church. So God knows uh, who uh, he will bring in. God knows uh, when he's going to bring them in. And God knows what uh, church, what community he will bring them in in order to be, uh, to be nurtured. Um, so we do what we, uh, what we are assigned. We finish our task. We fulfill our duties. We serve Christ as his servant. We do our utmost and give our best shot. And we trust uh, God for the result and he will not fail. Uh, so uh, so uh, as we look into uh, uh, the, just the, the, the principle of service and the principle of growth, we, uh, we know that, uh, that in season or out of season, we, we are called to serve the Lord. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's up to him, but he is gracious and he's powerful and he does not fail. And we are engaged in the work of the kingdom um, and therefore, it's a great privilege and a great joy to serve uh, to serve the Lord. But then uh, now, uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul uh, opened up for us uh, a third principle, and, and we want to spend time on that, and that is the principle of evaluation. Uh, uh, as he looked into his own life and uh, and, 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 and and the the, and the life he has uh, in the church uh, at Corinth, he he, he tells the people that now. Uh, verse 8, he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field and God's building. We are looking at the progression of Paul's thought on the importance uh, of service to the Lord, and that is uh, essential to, to the way Christians live their life. Uh, Paul telling us that we must uh, understand how God's work uh, we have to uh, serve with understanding of God's principle. And there's a definite connection as we, as we already seen the progression that Paul is building up uh, a theme that he's developed up in through his uh, argument. And he's pointing out that there's this progression. Uh, and, and, uh, and just uh, reconnect, with the progression start out with the understanding that we know who we are. We are God's servant, we are saved by grace but we are saved to serve uh, God. Uh, um, and we, uh, number two, that we uh, have to do our responsibility because God worked through what he's uh, assigned us to do. He gave us a job, he placed us uh, where we are at, and he suddenly assigned us uh, the work for his eternal kingdom. Uh, well, God alone accomplished his purpose. God alone renders the result. He alone causes growth. And we have value only when we are instruments in the master's hand, doing the master's business. I planted Apollo's water, but God was causing the growth. So neither the one who plants and the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Uh, but like we pointed out, uh, that uh, there's one point that, uh, that Paul is now setting up uh, uh, for us in terms of the principle guiding our life. Uh, the general question is, why should we worry about this? Uh, why should uh, the uh, Corinthians be alarmed that their immature uh, condition as babies in diapers uh, um, and uh, the, their life accomplishing very little for God uh, is something that uh, the, they have to have grave concern and they have uh, to, uh, uh, to really uh, awaken uh, to this reality. Um, and then also pointing uh, to, to us as well that why we need to be concerned about our attitude, uh, maybe lukewarm at, uh, at, uh, uh, in connection to God's service. Uh, maybe uh, we are discouraged and, and tired and, and burdened. Uh, why should we keep on when we feel like that? And he said, because there is a final evaluation. Uh, because we are called into accountability and because we have to uh, uh, report uh, our lives and our work uh, to, to the Lord who uh, is our master, and there will be a reward for the Lord uh, to each of uh, his servants uh, for their work on his behalf in obedience uh, in, uh, to his assignment. 
So we're going to focus mainly on verse 8 for this portion. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now the, the, the NIV renders it a bit different uh, uh, with one phrase, and that is the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. So if you uh, look into this, uh, this uh, component, uh, and we will spend our time looking at that and, uh, and expand it uh, out in application, now he who plants and he who waters are one, and then each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So let's look at uh, first uh, the unity of purpose in service. Uh, I want you to note that the NIV translation, as I pointed out, that the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. That is uh, the interpretive translation, uh, which means that you assign more meaning uh, to the word because of the context, because the uh, the phrase is simply they are one, as uh, in uh, NASB render he who plants and he who waters are one. Now the uh, the King James uh, uh, take that as being equal uh, are one in terms of equality, uh, to be equal in the in in their worth before the God, uh, equal in their potential for reward. Uh, now it can uh, only uh, can also be understood as uh, they are one in unity, uh, as uh, to do work uh, with one heart, uh, since uh, Paul is pointing out that uh, the uh, the Corinthians uh, are having problems with jealousy and strife and disunity in the church. Point uh, is uh, Paul is pointing out here that the service of God is done with the commitment to the unity uh, of the body, the church. Now, all of these uh, interpretations are uh, uh, by and large correct because they are uh, all in the same direction and they are commentary and they fit the context of uh, Paul's uh, flow of thought. But the NIV probably captured the force of the context the best and, uh, and that uh, it means that they are one in purpose in serving God's glory. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, uh, unity of purpose. Uh, because uh, Paul's uh, arguments uh, point out that uh, as we know that we are God's instrument and we know that he wants uh, to do eternal work in us and through us and we know that, uh, w that we are what we are meant to be uh, and uh, all that we can be when we are in the master's hand doing the master's work and uh, as we know that there will be a final evaluation uh, of all that we do and what then is the attitude? Uh, how, how, how do we uh, conduct our life when we know all these things? Well, we have one purpose, uh, and that is to serve well, and, and, and that is to serve you know, God's pleasure, and that is to, uh, to serve His glory. Uh, so uh, when everybody understands uh, the matter of service and accountability, uh, then uh, understand the, uh, the importance of that matter, then uh, we all have but one aim, and that is to serve Christ and serve well, to be pleasing to God, to fulfill our obligation, and to be found faithful in discharging our responsibilities and duty. Uh, so, so suppose that uh, we, we both understand that, Apollos understand that, I understand that, I want you to understand that, that we are one in purpose, we, will, we are wanting to do the utmost and serve with everything you have for the glory of Christ. So each one of us is given a different function uh, from the other, different, <coughs> different tasks, different assignment. Uh, so, so Paul said here that <coughs> the man who plants and the man who waters have different tasks, different assignments. But both are want um, in purpose and both work together in harmony uh, and unity for that one purpose. And the ultimate purpose of, uh, of our service is Christ's glory. Uh, <coughs> uh, the purpose uh, is the glory of God and, uh, and, uh, and of Christ. So, that, so that's, uh, that concept bear out in uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, Paul's uh, writing. And he pointed out to us that we are completely and totally uh, live for the Lord and uh, live for His glory. That is our purpose when we understand that there will be a measurement at the end, that uh, there will be an evaluation at the end. Uh, so our life and our service link directly to uh, the glory of Christ. 
it also linked directly to the reward that we will have uh, in Christ uh, as uh, we uh, all stand before him and give account of our lives at the end. Paul points this out uh, to say that we live or we die. Uh, we, uh, we do that all for the single purpose uh, of uh, his glory that uh, all Christians have uh, in unity uh, uh, and that is the purpose uh, to live for God's glory. Uh, in uh, in Romans 14, uh, Paul, uh, con con uh, Paul connect the, uh, the, uh, the concept of accountability uh, to uh, the devo devotion to Christ's glory and connect to uh, the reward that we will have at the end. So Romans 14, uh, verse uh, 7 to 12, uh, point that out for us. He said that for not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us die for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. Uh, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother, or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all will stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So each one of us will give account to himself to God. So here we understand that it is for his glory that, uh, that every tongue will, will, uh, will give God's praise, every knee shall bow before him, and that everyone will give account of himself to God, and we all will stand uh, the uh, before the judgment seat of God. And so uh, uh, the measurement of our life, and that is uh, we live or die, uh, we live for the Lord. Uh, we uh, die for the Lord. We don't do anything uh, for ourselves. Uh, none of us live for ourselves. None of us die for ourselves. So the motivation and the drive of our life is the glory of Christ. And uh, that is the ultimate reason for our service. Uh, and the reward that, uh, that Christ uh, gives to his servant or renders to his servant is uh, the reflection of that glory. So Christ brings us into the, the joy of his glory uh, to share in uh, the shining forth of that glory, to manifest that glory, uh, to participate in that glory. So we, 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 can, we can say that Christ share his glory to, uh, with his servants by giving them rewards, uh, and that is the capacity to enjoy him and to, uh, to uh, glorify him. And so when we say we uh, we uh, talking about rewards, we're not talking about uh, seeking uh, something that is independent of Christ, outside of Christ, but we are seeking Christ uh, uh, because the, the reward is connected to Christ. So seeking rewards from the Lord is seeking the Lord himself. Uh, therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We, uh, we hear people that, you know, if you seek, uh, seek reward, then you are selfish. Uh, well, it depends on uh, what you seek the, the rewards for, because uh, the rewards is from the Lord. It's uh, something that he treasures, something that he delights, <coughs> uh, he delights in, and, and now he gives it to those he loves. Uh, so what is most precious uh, to him, what is best and greatest and uh, highest good, uh, it is his own uh, person, it is his own glory. Uh, so the highest reward that can be given to his servant uh, is the capacity to glorify uh, God in eternity. Uh, so we, we will see that the greater the reward is the greater uh, capacity to enjoy God and glorify Him forever. Now to, uh, to enjoy God and to glorify Him forever is uh, the chief end of man according to the Westminster Catechism. Uh, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever is the chief end of man. Therefore it is the greatest reward that can be given to man is the capacity uh, to uh, enjoy God and to glorify Him forever. And uh, we will see that uh, in, uh, in a minute. But, but before we, uh, we, we dive into uh, the teaching on rewards and, and how it connects to us, let's look uh, at the word labor, uh, because this is fundamental uh, to the point Paul is going to make. He said, now who, uh, he who plants and he who waters are one, uh, so we're talking about the one in purpose, and that purpose is Christ's glory. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I want to look at the word labor here uh, as, 
uh, each one of us uh, normally have uh, different ideas about uh, labor. Uh, you know, we labor to do something and uh, the, some uh, just showing up to church uh, Sunday morning is uh, enough labor already. Uh, others, uh, you know, uh, somewhat involved is enough, that's enough labor. But the word labor, I want you to know that Paul used uh, a very particular word to describe what the Holy Spirit means by service. It is the, it is the word uh, kopos, and uh, with the root, it means to, uh, to be uh, beaten up. Uh, or to uh, to cut or to bleed, uh, the the word is used for chopping or or, or chest thumping, as in wailing. Uh, it is uh, talking about hurt as uh, in bleeding, uh, pain as wailing uh, for the dead. Uh, the whole thing means uh, hard labor, toiling, working until fainting and exhaustion because of hurt and pain. So as exhausting physical or mental exertion, we use words like toy, labor, uh, work, or, or, or the exhausting and wearisome difficulties uh, that we encounter in service. We use the word trouble, burden, hardship, uh, all uh, connect to this uh, the sense of being beaten up, uh, being cut up, and, 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 and bleeding. Uh, just think about, you know, those pictures is something very foreign to us when we're talking about service uh, to the church or in the church. Uh, this is a foreign concept uh, to us uh, because, uh, you know, some of us understand uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the idea of labor more than uh, others. But the, for the most part, when we're talking about serving God, uh, uh, people think the word involvement, uh, participation, contribution, uh, which means we do what we can. Now Paul said that, uh, well, think uh, of the word exhaustion, suffering, pain, bleeding, crying, which means we do what we can and, and do what we cannot. Uh, we take what fits and what is extra. Uh, so Paul said that, that we are God's servant, we do what we are told, we carry what is given uh, and load it on our shoulders. Uh, and sometimes it seems uh, a lot much, uh, uh, more than we can bear, but we trust that the, our Master is wise and gracious and merciful, and He will not let us carry uh, any load too heavy or too much, uh, and uh, anything that is beyond what He Himself provides uh, for, us to, uh, to, uh, for us to do so. Uh, so when we talk about uh, labor, we, 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 we do talk uh, not just to be, to be involved, not just to do a little, but it is uh, to do everything that we can and do more than we can uh, to, uh, to work until fainting and exhaustion uh, because of hurt and pain. And like I said, it is a foreign uh, concept. Uh, we, uh, we don't think that way. But scripture is full of, uh, of, uh, of that notion. Toy day and night and pain and suffering and, and burden and, uh, and travail and all these things is, is what uh, Paul talking about when he's talking about service. But, 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 but there's a guarantee uh, that, uh, that, the, the, that God will uh, not give us uh, more than what He wants us to handle. Uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter th uh, 10, verse 13, he talked about that in terms of temptation, challenges, and burdens that we will bear. But I want to, uh, to uh, paraphrase it in, in connection to service. Uh, so uh, let me paraphrase it this way. That no load will be given to you that is not given to somebody else already. You are not that unique. Uh, God knows uh, how much you can take, and He will never demand more than you, He provides. When you think you are running out of steam, know that He guarantees deliverance, so that with that knowledge, you can continue to stand the pressure to the end. So Paul is saying that, uh, that uh, it will be hard work, it will be uh, uh, doing uh, what, uh, that, what was needed and, and, uh, and what comes as extra, more than we expected, but, uh, but, uh, but God will not uh, ever demand uh, from us what he, uh, um, more than what He provides. So when we think that, uh, that we, we are at the uh, uh, what the, uh, the, the end of our endurance, uh, of our capacity. Uh, he guarantees that uh, He will provide deliverance. 
Now when we know that, uh, that, uh, the, that the burden that we bear will never exceed what he provides, uh, then uh, we can uh, continue to stand that pressure to the end and trust uh, that he will take us through to the end. Uh, when we cannot, then he will bail us out uh, or, or provide the deliverance. Now when I was thinking about this, uh, you know, I, I remember that when we were young, at least uh, when I was young, we liked to scare people by, you know, hiding somewhere and when they walk by, you jump out and say, boo! And uh, people got startled and, and, and kind of get scared of that. I was thinking that the, what the word boo in uh, Christian service in our time is the word burnout. When we jump out and say burnout, people get scared. Uh, you say that word and people drop everything and they run for the door and, you know, they run home and pick up the kids and close the door and protect themselves. Um, but, uh, but Paul said uh, the word uh, kopos, that is, uh, you serve to the max of your ability and more. And he said you won't burn out, uh, but you will increase in capacity. He, he's telling us that, you know, just like a bodybuilder, did not get to, to the point where he can lift the 300 pounds by quitting at 100 pounds. Uh, yes, you have to stay balanced and you have to be obedient in all areas of your life, but it is not hard work that kills you. Uh, it is uh, the inattention, it is the sin, it is the neglect of spiritual discipline that kills you. Uh, but those things are not uh, burnout. Burnout uh, is, an, an, uh, for the most part, uh, if you look at scripture, it looks like an excuse for taking it easy or uh, for laziness because uh, service requires obedience and uh, spiritual discipline. Uh, it is uh, the pain and it is the irritation, it is the disappointment, it is the load uh, that, uh, that we carry. And so uh, Paul reminds us that when, when we're talking about uh, serving the Lord here uh, and talking about evaluation at the end, uh, he said that serve to your capacity and more. Um, and sometimes the sense of exhaustion uh, is precisely what God wants us to have. Because the patience you must develop and the endurance you must build up, you don't develop these character traits by taking it easy. Let God either increase your capacity or open a way out. Um, but my feeling is that in most cases, it's not the way out that he has in mind that he will enable us to, uh, uh, to stay through and to increase our capacity uh, and able to handle more as uh, he work uh, his will in our lives and to uh, be more, uh, so that we can be more like Christ. Now why would we uh, worry about this matter of, uh, of serving uh, at full capacity? Why, why would we worry about serving at all? Uh, Paul said, uh, it is because uh, each will be rewarded according to his own labor. Uh, he said that, uh, why, do you, uh, uh, why should you be concerned about the matter of serving and, uh, and, and not just serving, not to get involved uh, only, but uh, to serve at full capacity and to suffer uh, hardship when you serve? He said, because uh, there will be uh, reward and the reward is according to your own labor. And, and so here is uh, it's, uh, it's something that we need to discover and understand. The reward is according to your own labor. There is a direct dependency uh, between your service and your future reward. Uh, this is the concept that, uh, that uh, Paul developed and now we want to see the detail. So the Bible is very clear. Everyone in the whole world, uh, over the whole history of uh, human existence, uh, will appear uh, before the judgment seat of Christ at the end and when they come to uh, the judgment seat of Christ at the end uh, they basically divide it into two groups uh, what Matthew 25 calls the sheep and the goat that is uh, the believers and the unbelievers now uh, when talking about the, the end time and judgment at the end time uh, scripture t tells us of many judgments that will happen uh, the judgment of Israel, uh, that we see that in Ezekiel chapter 20. Uh, number two, the judgment over the nations, we see that in Matthew 25. Uh, the judgment of Satan and demons, we see that in, uh, in Jude uh, chapter 6, uh, Jude verse 6. Uh, uh, number four, the judgment of the unsaved uh, at the great white throne judgment, we see that in Revelation 20. 
But what we want to focus on is number five here and the judgment of the believers and the judgment of, of their works. So there will be coming a day when we will be judged on the basis of what we have done. Uh, so we want to be clear on the concept of judgment of believers as opposed to the judgment of unbelievers. Uh, so, uh, so when we say uh, the principle of evaluation, we mainly look at uh, the, uh, the judgment of Christ uh, over the life of the believers uh, at the end time uh, or at the end of, 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 of our time and how we need to uh, 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 come to uh, before him in accountability. Now the first uh, understanding is kind of surprising and, and startling. And that is uh, the evaluation for, on our life is for reward, not for judgment. So the evaluation is for reward and not judgment. Uh, so for believers, we will want to make clear that there will be evaluation of our deeds, uh, our works, and our service before the judgment seat of Christ. But it is the, the evaluation for reward and not judgment. Uh, in, uh, in our popular culture, uh, uh, you know, everybody understands that you, you don't just march into heaven. Uh, there is a criterion uh, or requirements to enter uh, to heaven. And so, you know, we have this popular idea of St. Peter standing at the gate checking names. If you go there and, and, and in his list, uh, he has a checklist. And if your goodies, uh, you know, outweighs your baddies, meaning your good works are more than your bad works, then uh, he can let you in. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, uh, the, the checking at the gate. Now, obviously, there's no St. Peter checking names at the, the gate of heaven. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we get in not because we do more good than, than, than bad. Uh, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ seal uh, uh, our entrance uh, and our presence in eternity. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, uh, 20 tell us that, uh, that we are already citizens of heaven by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are already qualified for heaven by our faith in Christ. Uh, people say, uh, but, uh, but there's, there's, there's judgment for believers uh, because uh, for the sins they committed after they were saved. So when they, when they were saved, then they were justified. But after they were saved, they continued to sin. So at the end, uh, they still have to deal with that and, and, and there will be uh, punishment for those who sin uh, after they are saved. Uh, no, all your sins are taken care of on the cross. Uh, Jesus took all of our sin on him, past, present, future. Uh, well, in fact, uh, all of our sins were future when he died anyway. Uh, so uh, he uh, suffered on the cross and, uh, and bore uh, all of our sin uh, on his uh, on his body, and uh, and uh, satisfy the requirement for us. Uh, so, uh, some other will will say that uh, well, you have to deal with the, or you have to uh, be evaluated for the sin you didn't confess. Uh, this is quite popular, uh, uh, a very popular view, and that is the the, the ones you forgot to confess uh, or did not confess uh, willfully. Uh, you still have to uh, pay for it. You still have to uh, 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 deal with it. Now the Bible doesn't say that. Uh, and, and, and to say that is to betray uh, the understanding of confession. Confession has nothing to do for, with forgiveness. You don't get forgiveness because you confess. Uh, uh, forgiveness uh, has already taken place at the cross of Christ by His atonement work for us. Confession uh, means to say the same thing, to agree with God that we are sinners and uh, we come to grace to receive uh, total forgiveness and He already forgave us. Uh, so we never be condemned. Uh, condemnation and judgment for believers already took place at the cross and it is complete, it is done. So I want to make clear that we understand that because, you know, uh, we, when we think of uh, the time we stand before Christ, uh, in his judgment seat when he returned is when we deal with our shortcomings and sins and problems in our life and if we do uh, more good than, uh, than bad then uh, we have reward and no it is uh, not so we will never be condemned uh, because uh, condemnation already taken care of uh, we, we see that in Colossians chapter 2 let me just read that uh, for, for 
um, uh, confirmation here. Verse 13. When you were dead in your transgression and this uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out of the, the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when he has disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a dis public display of them, having triumphed over them uh, through him. Therefore, no one is to act as your church. Uh, and, and, and clearly, if we have uh, any doubt, uh, look at Romans uh, 8, uh, uh, verse 1. Therefore, there's, no more, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, so, so we not be, we, be, uh, we will not be condemned at the end, but we gather before the judgment seat of Christ for our rewards. Uh, it is the evaluation of our life works, but it's for rewards. Uh, so, so when we understand this, uh, then uh, Scripture tells us in one aspect uh, uh, that uh, it affects how we view our, ourselves, but also uh, how we view uh, the works of others. This doctrine has a very powerful impact on how we view the works of others. And this should cause us to think deeply and uh, talk very carefully as we talk about others and their work. Now we have a tendency to be critical and judgmental regarding the service of others in the church. Uh, we tend to give our opinion rather uh, freely without biblical foundation. Uh, we ought to keep our opinion conform to God's word and not running around sharing our opinion and evaluation of others because that job belongs to God and he will surprise us, uh, you know, uh, our, uh, um, uh, with our critical mind and our merciless heart sometimes uh, because uh, he will only give praise uh, to uh, people that we say uh, they're no good, they're, they're not doing their job. Uh, uh, he will not give condemnation and not critical judgment, only praise, only rewards. And this is another aspect of God's amazing grace that we don't know much about, or that we are so disconnected to it, uh, we uh, feel it's very foreign to our thinking. Uh, like I said, many Christians are fearful of the return of Christ uh, because they fear the final evaluation that they will come short. Well, obviously, everybody come up short uh, just as salvation given to us by grace with total justification uh, and no more condemnation, the evaluation of our works for God at the end is also by grace with no condemnation, no rebuke, only praise and reward by a loving and gracious Christ. Now, can we really believe that? Can, can it uh, be really just gracious reward, no condemnation, no rebuke at the end for true believers? But Paul pointed, pointed this out in his, uh, uh, when he talked to the church of Corinth where they are very critical of his works. They measure his service and the impact of the church according to what they like or they don't like. And this is Paul's response. If you just flip over to chapter 4. Uh, and in verse uh, 1 to 5 he said, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that uh, one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I be examined by you, or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet not by the, I'm not by this acquitted, but the one who examines is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of man's heart, and then each man prays will come to him from God. So the standard of measurement for service of God, uh, for, of his servants, and that is all of us, is faithfulness. But only God can measure faithfulness uh, because only God knows the heart of the servant. We can only see partly what is done on the outside, uh, but God alone can see the, and measure the depth of our motives and our attitude and our commitment from the inside. And actually, we have no business of rendering judgment on others' work. That function belongs to God. 
So Paul said, it doesn't really matter what you think of my work because uh, it doesn't carry any weight uh, because uh, that uh, evaluation belonged to God. Uh, so he said, but to me, it is a very small thing that I might be examined by you uh, or by any human court. Now, for us, we were bent backward uh, just, you know, to deal with the, with the judgment of others when they say, uh, something critical or semi-critical or uh, just uh, a little bit negative about what we do. We feel hurt and we feel uh, 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 that we need to vindicate ourselves and do all this. Paul said, that doesn't matter. Uh, and then he said that, uh, that it's not important that what I think of my own works, even though I know myself better than anybody else. I mean, I know my motives, I know my heart, I know my effort, I know what it takes. But I can't measure myself by God's standard. So he said, in fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. He said, uh, my opinion of what, uh, what I do, uh, my uh, self-evaluation, doesn't matter at the, at the end. So only God will measure the quality and the quantity of the works of his servant. But the one who examined me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. But wait until the Lord uh, uh, comes, who will be both bring the lights hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of man's heart. You know, when we read this, we say, he's going to nail them. He's going to nail those, who, you know, because he, he sees he see things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motive of man's heart. Uh, he he sees that when we serve, we serve with mixed motive. Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's something, you know, uh, uh, short in our effort and... And then something, uh, you know, fleshly in our work. But how does God measure the work? We would say that he will, uh, you know, we see that he finds the bad and the good and the ugly. And he will rebuke us for what we don't measure up. And he will reward us for what we do that is adequate. But that's a fallacy of our, uh, of our understanding. Because nobody serves adequately. Nobody measures up. Nobody does what God wants completely. So how does God measure the work? By grace. He gives only reward and no rebuke. Only blessings and no judgment. He said, and then each man praise will come to him from God. So every believer will have praise. Uh, they won't, uh, there, will, there, will, there will not be anybody who will get condemned at the end. There won't be anybody who uh, gets shipped back to hell from heaven. Uh, there'll be no one who will be punished because uh, Christ bore all our punishment already. Uh, there will be only praise, but there will be varying degrees of praise depending on the, upon the work of your life. And we will we'll see that in a moment. So first we want to establish that, uh, that uh, our evaluation at the end when we stand before the judgment of Christ it's not for condemnation. It's not to determine whether we go to heaven or go to hell. Uh, it's, it's, it's not whether we be rebuked because our work, uh, our lack of work, our shortcomings uh, in, in our work will be given grace uh, at the end and there will be con uh, uh, con commendation and there will be praise. Now, uh, uh, there's a lot of details that we need to understand on that and, and the next one is uh, that we need to, to understand that its reward is based on work. So here the, the second aspect we need to understand and be clear about is that our reward is based on our work. Each will be rewarded according to his own labor. So we are saved by grace but our reward is based on works. Um, but more precisely, we are saved uh, uh, based on the work of Christ uh, in grace, and our reward is based on our work also in grace. Our salvation and our rewards are both on the basis of works, uh, and both by grace. Salvation is based on the works of Christ on our behalf, and given to us in grace because we don't deserve it. Our reward is the same. It's based on our works and given, us, uh, to, given to us in grace, not because we qualify, but because we don't deserve it. But God is gracious. And so uh, reward is based on works. Uh, and so it means uh, there is a pro proportionality to the amount of, of work, which is quantity, and the quality of work, which brings glory to Christ in the king, uh, kingdom purpose. The rest of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, passage that we read from 
five to fifteen, he will be talking about the quality of work, you know, get, what got burned uh, burn up and what remained at the end. But I want to establish the, the, the fact that uh, scripture is very clear and very abundant in telling us that, uh, that, uh, that our reward will be based on works. God rewards us on the basis of our works for the kingdom. Uh, there's a lot of uh, verses, I'll, I'll, I'll try to read a few to, uh, just to get the impact of it. Uh, first, the reward uh, is an expression of who God is. Uh, Psalms uh, 62 verse 12, And love and kindness is yours, O Lord, for you recompense a man according to his work. In Proverbs 24 verse 12, he said, uh, If you say, See, we did not know this, or does he not consider who weighed the heart? And does he not know who keeps the soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? So who God is, uh, and, and part of who God is, is that uh, he will render to man according to his work. Uh, the reward is an expression of what God can do in his power. Uh, he said that in Jeremiah uh, verse 17, uh, 17 verse 10, I the Lord search the heart, I test the mind, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the result of his deed. And uh, Jeremiah still uh, 32 uh, verse 18. Uh, o great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great is uh, great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways uh, of the sons of man, given to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruits of his deed. So we see this over and over, over again, God. Uh, uh, now, for the unbelievers, they will be judged according to their deeds. That's, uh, that's different. They will, they, there will be condemnation on the basis of, of, of their works that is unrighteous and, and, and anti-God and outside of His grace. But for believers, it is only praise. Uh, verse 20, uh, verse uh, uh, 27 of Matthew 16, it is uh, an expression of Christ's authority at His return. For the Son of Man is going to come uh, in glory for his Father and his angels and will then recompense uh, every man according to his deed. Uh, Roman uh, 2 uh, verse 6, uh, God will render to each person according to his deed. Uh, and we have our text uh, in uh, chapter 3 verse 8, He who plans and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Um, and now uh, uh, the familiar text in Second Corinthians chapter five, verse nine, tell us that uh, we are uh, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may uh, be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Uh, verse uh, uh, 17 of 1 uh, Peter 1 As uh, you address the Father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Uh, Revelation uh, the 22 Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. So clearly, uh, uh, we are uh, to be concerned and to, be, uh, uh, to have understanding that, uh, that uh, our life will be uh, evaluated for reward uh, on the basis of our works. Salvation is by grace on the works of Christ. Reward is by grace on the basis of, of our work for Christ. And so this is a huge understanding, the bottom line is, and, and that is uh, salvation depends on God's choice of us uh, by His grace, but our reward depends on our response in obedience, uh, in service to God. Now there's another aspect that I want to point out in, in our text when he said, uh, now uh, he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Uh, the reward is uh, to each individual. Uh, from our text, we, we, we see that the reward to each person is on individual basis. So it's uh, for reward, not judgment, it's, uh, it's based on works, but it's uh, also on individual basis. Now, uh, why do we say that? Because we serve together uh, in unity of purpose for God's glory as members of the body uh, of Christ in the, in the church. 
uh, each one with his own function and, and, and assignment, uh, but we serve in the unity of the body. Uh, like Paul said, uh, he who plants and he who waters are one, one in purpose, uh, one in, uh, uh, in uh, the dedication and unity for the, glory of, uh, for the glory of Christ. But our reward is given on the individual basis, each one, each person, according to his own work. There's no team award as such. Each will be rewarded according to his own labors. Uh, and, 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 and the verses that we just read previously uh, clear on that, They're talking about each man, each person, everyone, every man, talking about his own reward, his own works, his own deeds. Uh, so it's, it's kind of similar to uh, salvation, each one his own soul. Each person must make a decision for Christ, a person respond to receive atoning work of Christ on the cross, a personal commitment and submission to the Lordship of Christ, new birth by the Holy Spirit, uh, and a personal walk with Christ evident in sanctification, and personal fruitful life of service. So the personal fruitful life of service is the basis of a personal reward that the believers will receive at the end. We don't get saved for somebody else and we cannot share the benefit of salvation. So the same thing, uh, we cannot share uh, rewards uh, uh, for somebody else. Each person must serve in order to receive the reward. Now, well, uh, now we, we, we want to point out uh, why, why, why it is so, because we are saved to serve. Uh, we are saved to serve. The reason the reward is given on the same basis, uh, individual basis as salvation, is because uh, the spiritual service is tied directly uh, to salvation by grace. Uh, <laughs> Ephesians 2 uh, verse uh, 8 to 10 makes this clear. Uh, the, I won't go into the detail, but uh, just read that and you will see it uh, very apparently. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Uh, so here uh, is, uh, is what uh, the connection. God wants to magnify his grace. And so in grace he saved us sinners to himself. But uh, God wants to see grace uh, uh, in the life of his person he saved. So he gave them works to do so that in grace uh, he prepare beforehand the eternal work for each believer and so we are saved to serve uh, and when we serve then grace is magnified uh, and God delights to give us a reward to further magnify his grace uh, so service is uh, the way God adds more blessing of grace to our salvation and so everyone who serves uh, the reward is the way God extends his glory uh, to cover those who serve in his delight. Um, so uh, uh, we are clear that we, uh, we serve together in, in the church, uh, in the family, in the body of Christ. Uh, each one of us is given a gift, uh, gift to do. Uh, and uh, and uh, the benefits of life in the church is not individualistic, meaning it's not based on individual works or contribution, but it is shared by all. But there's a, there's a difference uh, as we want to distinguish it here. So in the church, some serve more than others. Uh, some give more than others. Uh, some just don't contribute uh, very much, but take much. Uh, some are just consumers uh, focus only on themselves. But all share in the benefits and life of the church without distinction. For example, you know, on average, 20% uh, of the people in the church shoulder 80% of the financial burden of the church. Uh, on average, 10% uh, of the congregation carry 90% of the work of service in the church. That is uh, by, you know, a mega church's uh, survey. Uh, uh, in our church, uh, the average is much higher and we are blessed by that. Uh, but uh, everybody sharing the life of the church together. Uh, those who don't give and those who don't serve uh, are not prevented from participation. But when it comes to reward, only those who serve get their reward. And those who serve much will get much. And those who serve little will get little. And those who don't serve get none. And you may share the benefits uh, of the service by others uh, while in the church together.
but you do not share their rewards. So that's why we need, we need to look at the words each and his own. Each one, everybody gets evaluated. Everybody uh, um, uh, measured by his own work. There's no team paper. There's no team grade. There's no group average. Everybody is according to his own couple's labor. So the, the, but, 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 but here is an the, it's, it's the important link that we need to, to make uh, so that we understand why it is an urgent matter for us. And that is the aspect number four. Works on earth determine capacity to serve in heaven. So here's a very important concept that, uh, that uh, if we don't have this clearly in our mind, uh, we, we will not conduct our life uh, in the way that, uh, that uh, God wants us, want us to do. Our works on earth determine the capacity for us to serve in heaven. Now we understand that, uh, you know, uh, on earth we can accumulate uh, a lot of stuff uh, in this world, possession stuff, you know, toys, cars, houses, money, investment portfolio, and, you know, we tend to measure our success by how much stuff we have. As uh, the saying goes, he who dies with most toy wins. You're familiar with that, with that. But we also know that naked we are born into the world and naked we will leave the world. All the stuff we accumulate, we cannot take anything with us into the world to come. Now that is true in the physical world. Empty-handed, we, uh, we come into the world. Empty-handed, we will leave. But it turns out in the spiritual realm, we do bring one thing into heaven with us. That is our works. We bring our works with us into eternity. And this connection is extremely important because our works on earth determine our capacity to enjoy God and serve Him in, in, in eternity. Scripture tells us uh, that every believer takes something into eternity with them, and that is their works. Turn with me to Revelation thir uh, 14, and verse 13 tells us that this is what, Post uh, what the Apostle John said, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. So when, when they die, they go to heaven, their works follow them. Their works get transferred from earth to heaven. And I'm afraid that the church don't understand this very well, uh, very neglectful in understanding this transfer, this connection. Our works for God will follow us into heaven. If we have done much work on the earth, we will have much on he in heaven. If we have little work on the earth, we will have very little in heaven. And so this is the whole basis of living our life. Uh, even in the gospel, we see that this is the basis uh, of, of the call to invest in heaven. Because of this link, uh, because uh, the work uh, follow us into heaven, we are called to invest in heaven and to be rich in heaven. We are called to live our lives on earth uh, as an investment to prepare us for the life in eternity. And this is uh, the, 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 the biblical way to live. This is uh, the, the wise way, according to God, uh, to live. Uh, Matthew 6, uh, 1921 is clear, it's, uh, it's very familiar. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, <coughs> where neither moth nor rust destroy, where, uh, where thieves do not break in or steal, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Uh, so we are told to invest in heaven, store up yourself treasures in heaven, to be rich toward God in eternity. Now, to be rich is what? It's to have capacity and resources that exceed your need. Uh, if you have more than you need, then you're rich. Uh, so that's by definition. So it's talking about capacity. To be rich in heaven is to have capacity in heaven. And what do you do in heaven? Uh, you enjoy God and serve Him forever in heaven. So to be rich in heaven is to have a large capacity to enjoy God and to serve Him forever. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, several times that in heaven everybody is fulfilled. Nobody feels lacking in anything. But uh, according to their own capacity, uh, some will come into uh, heaven with the capacity of a little cup that we use for communion. It will get, uh, you know, all filled up and he will feel uh, completely 100% uh, 
fill, but the capacity is that little cup. Others may come with a bigger cup, others may be, you know, a big uh, tank, others may be like a big lake, uh, as, as far as to, uh, to, uh, the, to, uh, to, 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 to see the connection. So to be rich in heaven is to have the capacity to enjoy God and to serve Him. And we have to remember that this capacity is what you have forever. It is for a whole eternity. So the connection is if you bring home the little cup, you will have that little cup forever. You will enjoy God in that capacity forever. And so we are called to invest in heaven. And how do you do so? You invest in eternity by your works for God now on earth while you live on the earth. First uh, Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 tells us very clearly. Uh, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope uh, on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Well, what, what is unclear about that? That, uh, that we are to be rich in good works and generous and ready to share. Why? Because doing so will be storing up for, for us the treasure of good foundation for the future, which is life in heaven. So it's clear on how to invest in heaven, and that is uh, how you build capacity in eternity to enjoy God and serve Him forever. You build up by service. But then there's a principle here that we need to understand that, uh, that really, uh, uh, when we capture this, uh, this principle, it, uh, it uh, just changed the way we view our life and uh, view our service. Uh, our, our work will be multiplied. Uh, what happens when you commit your life to, to serve Christ in His kingdom? He will multiply your investment in the kingdom many, many folds. Uh, it will be multiplied, you know, zillion times, I'll, I'll just say, uh, beyond imagination. Now we remember the miracles of Jesus feeding the 5,000 men, uh, we, we remember that the disciples put in Jesus' hand five loaves of bread and two little fish, and he multiplied it out to feed 5,000. It's actually more around 20,000 if you count women and children. So the disciples put the meager meal they have in the Lord's, the Lord's hand. He blesses it and gives it back to them, and uh, they give it to the people, and the Lord miraculously multiplies to feed all the people. Now our work in His hand will be multiplied to this vast capacity to serve in heaven. Uh, we cannot even imagine uh, the increase or the multiplier factor. But when we serve the Lord on earth, he, we put our lives in uh, that uh, and everything that He has given us into His hand, back into His hand, and He will multiply what we entrusted to Him into capacity unspeakably large to fit the work He has prepared us for heaven. <coughs> Now the parables of talent in uh, Matthew 25 nails down this principle and I want to point that out to you. The story starts out, uh, you know, quite familiarly uh, with uh, the, the master of the servants going on a trip away and he gathers his servants and he gives one five talents and another two talents and another ten, one talent to make gains for him. And let me just read from verse 19, uh, Matthew 25. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves uh, came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came and bought five uh, more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said uh, to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You uh, were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of the master. Now, there are more details of the story, but uh, I just want to highlight the, this principle. The work is multiplied many folds in the reward. You notice that the works of the servants are different. You know, one with five talents returned five more, and 
the one with two talents returned two uh, more. But the same reward is given uh, in the multi uh, multiplication factor. His master said, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge in many things. Uh, so the few things, uh, the few become the many. Uh, there's a transfer from earth to heaven and the few become the many. Uh, I will put you in charge of many things. So what if the, the, multiplica, the, the, the multiplier or the, the, the factor is just say a billion, uh, a zillion, uh, a gazillion, we, we, we just don't, can't imagine the factor because this is for eternity. Then it would be stupid indeed not to make the investment of our life for such a return. But there's another factor that we need to see and that is there is proportionality it will be proportional to how, how much we invest, how much we serve. So Jesus tells a similar parable <coughs> in Luke 19, but with a different principle in mind, and this time the focus is uh, being on the, reward, uh, on the reward being proportional to the works. Uh, so that is, the more works you do, the more reward you have. In Matthew 25, it is the multiplication principle, and that is uh, stated for us. In Luke 19, it is the proportionality. Let's look in, uh, in uh, Luke 19, and it's, it's uh, similar. Uh, the master goes away and gives ten servants, uh, each one the same uh, one minor, uh, to make gains for him. Uh, uh, so when he's gone away, he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minors, uh, meaning uh, one each, and say, do business until I, re I, re I come back. So let me read from verse uh, 15. Luke 19, 15 on. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered uh, that this slave to whom he had given the money to, uh, to uh, be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared and said, Master, your miner has made ten miners more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in, a very, uh, in very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came and said, Your minor master have, been, um, uh, have made five minors. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. So each of the servants is given uh, one minor equally. It's different from the parable of talents in Matthew 25, which point uh, two different gifts in, uh, for each person. But here we can say that each one is given the same portion, you know, like one life to give, uh, to, to live. They're given the same time, 24 hours each day, uh, same seven days each week, and how they work in their lives uh, for the master determines their reward. Uh, the one that makes 10 times uh, gain uh, a reward proportionally, a master, your minus uh, made 10 minus more, and uh, he said, well done, good slave, uh, you are in charge of 10 cities. Uh, the one with five saying, uh, I have made five minus, and he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. So we see the multiplication principle, one minor uh, gain, uh, uh, return one city. Uh, again, a huge factor. And you also see the proportional, uh, proportional principle, one minor to ten minus uh, reward ten cities. And uh, one minor to five minus reward uh, five cities. So, 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 so we, so we see here these numbers and units, uh, you know, one, five, ten, uh, minus and cities, uh, are just symbols and means to communicate the eternal principle of works uh, for the Lord. That what we do on earth translate in an, an unspeakable huge capacity to serve God in eternity. And our work do get transferred from earth to heaven with multiplication in proportionality of our works. So you serve as a level of five minus in this life. Your reward is huge capacity be in charge in five city in heaven. And likewise, 10 will be 10 city. That's just for us to understand. But let me just, uh, try to put this concept in terms that we can relate to. Just say, you know, the richest man in the world uh, alive today, Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, I don't know, they keep switching uh, position. And if uh, the, he comes to you and give you $10, and said, uh, here, $10 for, your, for, for you to invest. You can spend your money any which way you want, but if you invest in my company 
for each one, uh, dollar you invest in one year, I personally guarantee one billion do dollar in return. What are you going to do? You know, in the world of uh, two percent interest on saving account, what would you do? Well, the answer is no brainer, obvious. Uh, you put back uh, uh, ten dollars into his hand and, uh, and empty your pockets and for any extra that you might have, and ask him to take it too, right? Or are you thinking, you know, you know, he said that what I want right now is a Big Mac and a big ice cream cone. Uh, so that would set me back eight dollars. I'll keep another dollar just to play around for rainy day. So I'll invest one dollar in your company. Thank you very much. Well, how smart is that? Yet that is exactly what many of us are doing with our lives when it comes to serving the Lord with the resources and opportunities he has given to us in grace. He guarantees gazillion return for all eternity, the capacity to serve God and enjoy him forever. What then do you put back in his hand so that he can reward you at the end? Just think about that a bit. I mean, uh, it's come, up, uh, come back to a very simple understanding. So we have to build our life with that understanding and, and, and we, re we remember that it is grace. Uh, what God, uh, uh, principle of measurement uh, of our life before him, tell us about his grace. Uh, be, be, because uh, we know what we deserve, we, we know what we are like. In uh, Luke 17:10, uh, uh, he knows what we are like. He said, "So you too, when you do all the things which are uh, commanded you, you say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. So we are unprofitable. We are unworthy slaves. We don't even deserve to serve, much less to, to be rewarded for our service." But scripture also tells us the heart of God. He delights in grace. He is true to his gracious nature. He will give praise. He will give rewards. He will not forget our meager, unprofitable service. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, it stated for us, For God is not unjust as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. God said, I will owe you nothing. I will render to you in my grace uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, you will have reward, you will have praise, you will have return beyond imagination. So we have one purpose, and that is uh, we serve the glory of Christ. And we remember the definition of service. It is hard work, it is pain, it is all out, it is an exhaustion, it is uh, increased capacity, uh, it is uh, given God all that you have. And the evaluation of, for reward is, uh, the evaluation is for reward, it's not for judgment. For believers, it is at the end, reward only. But the reward is based on work. Each one will be rewarded according to his own labor. The reward is to each individual, there's no share. Uh, each person uh, on individual basis, each will be rewarded according to his own labor. And the works on earth determine capacity to serve in heaven. What you do here, get transferred, connected, multiply, and large. So what shall it be? Back to the picture of $10 converted to $10 billion. So you go all in for the life of service, or you go in first for Big Mac and ice cream. Think this through and apply it to our lives. So share with your, uh, your, your person next to you and say, this is what God's speaking to me today. And then pray together before him.